shall we introduce ourselves to you, David? Uh, I'm Austin, and this is my friend Sable. We're both huge Please. fans of you. Oh. Mm -hmm. we, we we love your music. Uh, we listened to all your albums before this, so cool. Yeah, we absolutely love you. Uh, Thanks for listening, man. Thanks for listening. So let's get into like more of the meat of the discussion. Sure. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, your fan base. Y you seem to have a very unique fan base as to where um, they're always willing to support you uh, no matter what. Uh, of course, they're, uh, they, they say what they, they do, and they're n not really afraid to say what's on their mind. Um, so I just want to say, what do you love about your fan base specifically? And uh, what are some, or maybe like, what are some of your best memories with some of your fans? Uh, you know, that's that's a that's a that's a that's, a, that's an involved question. Uh, yeah, I uh, I love really meeting them with you know directly when we're actually on the road and there's like a hiding session and whatnot. And then we can be like one on one and everyone's screaming and hollering all at once. It's it's wonderful. I love that. And we can just you know take a few at a moment and converse and then uh, bring some other ones in and, and chat with them. We like, I, I, I especially enjoy meeting people on, on the road like like that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think people who really get into Verdant Steel um, get into Verdant Steel because they're, they're maybe similar to us in a way that they, uh, they like some of the same things we like. Maybe they share some of the same philosophy. You know, the ones who really get deep into you know what, what we do. Because I, I can tell from the the letters I get and emails and whatnot that they're they're really into um, some of the paganistic aspects of what we do and and of so course. on and so forth. So that's always uh, 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 something I really really enjoy. And then if they ask me, I, I don't I don't like spout my own. Uh, personal philosophies to people but if they mm -hmm. want to ask me something that i will you know generally divulge and go off on those tangents so it's it's nice when they really get deep deep into it and uh yeah some people like uh it's it's a strange thing because some people who who um got into us with say an album like noble savage they want more of that and more of that and more of that and those who got into us with life among the ruins they want more of that more of that, more mm -hmm. of that. yeah of course so, like you know we uh we just do what we do and uh hopefully um um they'll get most of it or some at least you know the, the, the bulk of it or whatever along the way or some of it or any of it that's fine by me we do you know whatever record we're uh we're in the mindset for at a given moment it's not mm -hmm. like okay we're gonna remake uh age of consent or, or or marriage or whatever it's just whatever whatever it is in wherever wherever we're emotionally dwelling in that moment that's what the record will be you know and that's what the new album is of course uh i saw an interview uh with you from tw i think it was 2015 on the nocturnes tour where you're talking about how you can't expect uh you to be the same person who made noble savage or asia consent uh you gotta change it up because uh you do it for your own sanity really and because it reflects who you are in the moment and how you're changing so i really respect that about you and the rest of the band of course i think you have to be honest with what you are and and, and what skin you're in in any given moment so every mm -hmm. record was made from the standpoint of this is exactly who i am in that moment when making age of consent i was that guy i mean i'm still that guy he's still there but, but of course they're yeah. said it different uh uh, that are that are more important to me now than than perhaps you know then in some ways and you know you're surrounding yourself with different people you've got different experiences mm -hmm. and every album is really a reflection of whatever it is I mean I write the all the lyrics so you know uh, it's really a reflection of what my world is at the moment you know even if it's shrouded in myth it's still I'm still speaking about what's going on in my particular sphere of existence. Of course. Uh, so you got the next question, Sable? I actually was going to ask, you mentioned a sign, when meeting fans at signing sessions a minute ago. Are you planning on doing any signing sessions for the new album? Yeah, if we can have some, you know, some record stores in the area or wherever we are on the road, I would be delighted to do that. Or at the end of a, of a gig, sure, sure. We always do that. 
So you're planning on going out on the road again? You got a tour in mind? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Are uh, you planning on going out on the road again? You have a tour in mind to support the uh, next album? We're doing, uh, we've got dates in Spain and uh, Crete at the moment, and we're working on, we're in negotiations for um, Italy, Greece, uh, and uh, Germany at the moment. So there'll, there'll be more dates. Yeah, yeah. And we'll do some shows in the U.S. also. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, so we we both love your lyrics and we, we take a look at them and we, we learn them from multiple listens. And we really appreciate like the poetry of it all and the romanticism of, of it also. And really, I just think it's really beautiful because when I when I first listened to you, uh, like the Bernie of Rome, for example, it, it your voice uh, paired with the lyrics matched very well with uh, the emotions and of course, of course. And uh, so I just want to know if like these skills, I think that they would like work really well with like writing a book. It, has that ever been like an interest of yours, maybe? Oh, that definitely is an interest of mine. Yeah, yeah, I want to do that. The autobiography or the everything you want to know about Burton Steel, but we're afraid to ask kind of a thing. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I am. I am actually jotting things down and I'm uh, making little, little, little arrangements, uh, uh, so, um, outline of what it would be. Yeah. So I need to just like, you know, take a year off and just do that because that's I'm, I'll, I'll dive deep into that. I always dive deep into every project. So that will be a deep one. So so like you're more of a guy who sort of focuses on on one thing at one time and you just go out on it as opposed to just building up pieces of it over time. I write a lot. I write daily. I write nightly. I'm, I'm, always, I'm always writing bits of, of this, that, and the other thing. And then they, you know, I develop these ideas into, you know, full scale works as we go along. So there's always stuff. I'm, I'm always writing globally. And then I'll say like, all right, these eight or nine songs could work with this idea, and then mm -hmm. build further from there. And I'm always working on like, I'll, uh, for lack of a better term i'll say song cycles i'm always working on these various song cycles so i have something already ready for the next album after this dionysus mm -hmm. uh it's actually about it's about 50 percent done already you know from the studio aspect um and there's several other song cycles for after that so uh, how they'll all end up i don't i don't know that that also comes into place when we're actually tracking oh yeah that's really wonderful that really worked with this and then so mm -hmm. you, you alter the scheme a little bit so it's always a little bit in flux but i'm always i'm always i'm always writing always writing of course as a songwriter too i understand uh a little bit of being on the, on the hassle and you know staying up late at night with ideas that prevent you from going to sleep you know <laughs> you're like i gotta write this down so yeah yep. uh, and that's actually a great um uh, starting point right there uh let's talk a little bit about the new album and like the marketing so to speak so it's coming out on cd uh vinyl and there will also be a digital release also yes uh you can get it now through uh correct me if i'm wrong but steam hammer and multiple other online real uh, realtors yes um so what i want to know specifically is like the background of making this album and what you're really going for here musically and lyrically uh i wrote the songs over you know i don't know i i, I don't even really know exactly how long it, it took to write them because mm -hmm. i was also writing other things when when i was doing that so uh it's difficult unless i go back and look you know in my notes um but it it seemed to arrive pretty quickly you know the initial spark of everything then the development mm -hmm. began and i got it developed enough to write to where i could go in and start sketching it on the uh piano in the studio and that's what we always do it's always like done that way first and then uh i brought edward in uh he kept asking me when are we going to do that record when are we gonna do that record he really liked you know my piano you know, versions and stuff yeah he said yeah we're gonna do it. we're gonna do it. we're gonna do it. you just gotta you know you gotta block out you know a, a, a lot of hours there because it's it's involved and he said yeah i'll do it i'll do it so, so he he j jumped in and uh we got uh, all his tracks done pretty quickly over a matter of a few weeks or a month or so, you know, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, 
and then I did all the vocals, and then we went from there with you know with the rest of it, all, all the other orchestra type things were added you know later on. And then what really always takes the longest is the mixing because I never, I'm never satisfied you know with with that standpoint of it. Of course, it's, yeah. You know, I, when we did the last uh, in the box set, I was actually I actually remixed. Um, after I delivered the record, I was still mixing the record. You know, mm -hmm. this is just how I'm a maniac. And uh, same thing with this record, you know, pr pretty much. But I did stop. I haven't. I'm not mixing it anymore. It's 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 out. It's it's coming out, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, so what I was what was I looking to achieve? Well, I'm interested in dualities, opposites, things that are forbidden to be together and are supposed to be together and joining them and seeing what's this third element. I've always been interested. I'm the marriage of, of course. Even hell is like that also, you know, but this was more to do with um, these Dionysian aspects of what what makes Dionysus tick and what makes us tick because we're all a bit, you know, pagan in our, in our way, I think. Uh, mm. So you've got this idea of freedom and restraint control release idea so bringing that together and how do we um live in a society how do we live in society and is there room in society for the letting go aspects of ourselves because dionysus that's one of his names the god of letting go yeah and, uh my conclusion is yeah we need that we need to let go otherwise we go mad that's why people like you know heavy metal festivals and whatnot it's it's very much a, a release of you know, the daily bullshit that goes on with with us. So that's what I was getting at with that and um, working out a few uh, other issues in there, which, are, you know, mm -hmm. the listener will arrive at their own thoughts with what that is. There's there's the idea of with with Dionysus is that and this idea of duality is that something can be one specific have one specific meaning but it also is its polar opposite at the same moment. So that's what's going on on the record. So this, this is in addition to this Dionysian mythological tale, there is something else going on. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about this uh, new single, which actually came out on the 10th. Um, when, I, when I gave it a listen for the first time, I was like, what the, what the hell is this? Because it gave me like sort of like a, a throwback to uh, sort of visions of Eden or the black light back. Uh, how do you say it? Back uh, Alana. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in both the lyrics and the music, really. And uh, I really liked the rhythm guitar on it, being a guitarist, of course. The the passages that both uh, uh, Josh Block and Ed, Ed did. Um, really, I think it's like a... a a unique sort of uh, energy that we haven't really seen in uh, in years, and it even gave me like traces of something from like Wings of Vengeance with your vocals. It sort of reminded me of that a little bit. Uh, so, if you could, uh, why do you think this was the best uh, pick for a single slash lyric video? Uh, I thought it had a lot of the elements that the record does contain in that one mm -hmm. song, you know. And um, it was not super long. There is a track on the record that's over 12 minutes called yeah. The Ritual of Descent. Uh, um, and it's not the shortest one either, which is uh, two minutes and 24 seconds long, but it's very complete in itself, you know? Yeah. This is our version of a paranoid or communication breakdown, something just a real short. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh okay, yeah, that kind of a thing. Uh, so yeah, I thought I thought it would make the most sense to get people interested in in the record. So that's why I went with that one. Um, yeah, it's I I think it's it's indicative of what the rest rest of the record does sound like. I mean, that it's 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 broad. There's a lot going on in the record. It it goes through a lot of terrain, but it all stays in that barbaric romantic style. Mm -hmm. you know? There are two sort of gothic-y, ballad-esque, ballad-esque things on there. Like, you know, something like uh, When Dusk Fell from Visions of Eden, that sort of vibe, you know. One of my favorite songs. I love oh, that yeah? song. Cool, yeah. Cool. Mine as well. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So when uh, you were describing the uh, theme of the new album, 
reminds me of one of my favorite albums, Rush by Hemispheres. It has some similar ideas with order and chaos and love and reason opposites. And that also features uh, Dionysus and ideas from Greek mythology. Did you ever listen to that album or were you influenced by Rush at all? I like Rush. I, I'm not so familiar with that record, but I, I was aware of it. Yeah. And I actually, I, I think I did see them on that tour. Yeah. Uh, wow. Nice. Yeah. 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 I I really liked uh, Moving Pictures a lot. Oh, yeah. That, that first one. live album I thought was brilliant. That first one, All the World's Stage. Yeah. I love his vocals. Yeah, I love that album. Yeah. That's amazing. Great album, great album. Yeah, yeah, I love that when it when it when it first uh, arrived on our shores here. Yeah, definitely. I saw them. Uh, I saw them a lot. Of, a lot. Rush. It's one of those bands I've seen a lot of. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, great band. Definitely great band. Yeah, they're my favorite. I really like their lyrics. Uh, your lyrics are also another reason why I got into Virgin Steel so much when Austin introduced me to me a few months ago. I don't write songs, but I do enjoy writing and reading a lot. I like mythology, philosophy, literature, and I really like your themes and your lyrics and all of that. Thank you. Thanks very much. I greatly appreciate that. Somebody yeah, and, watching, someone's listening, that's good. <laughs> and that's why I brought him on. <laughs> cool, man. Cool. Uh, so I want to talk like a little bit about your early life because uh, it, it's such a unique parallel to in uh, like a complete opposite to m my early life like you grew up a very in a very uh, theatrical and musical family uh, uh, as meanwhile i'm like the only person in my family that's really interested in that kind of stuff uh i just want to like how do those influences uh affect you musically in in a compositional style i think i could not have turned out any other way in the yeah. way i grew up it was like we had my dad with the theater, you know, live theater going on. Mm -hmm. That's where I was introduced to Greek myth and whatnot. Uh, he was doing a production of Medea, you know, and I was like, wow, fascinated. And then um, my older sister was an opera singer, still is actually an opera singer. Mm -hmm. And my other two siblings, my brother and sister, they were involved in rock bands. So this environment was very, very exciting. I was, I was the last child, I was the youngest. Yeah. And, uh, I'm sitting there watching, you know, everything that's going on. I went, I got to jump in. How do I do it? <laughs> so at eight years old, I started taking piano lessons. And then I joined my first rock band as a vocalist at the age of 11. And I just kind of have been synthesizing, cross-pollinating all those elements since, uh, since I began all those things. Yeah, and I'm still very much, very much excited by all of that. Yeah, I'm not at all like bored by music or theater or film or anything. Oh yeah, of course, I wake up every morning and I want to, I want to rip into it. You know, we're doing videos, uh, some other videos now. We're we're doing another lyric video for the next single, but um, I'm also doing a uh, like a more of a um, I don't know, I don't know how you describe, it, but we're we're in it, but it's this, it's got stills, but it's also got moving parts. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, in there, yeah. yeah. Hey, I look forward to the next single, man. Um, but mm -hmm. so, you, so you also produce your own albums. Uh, does that help you fulfill like what you uh, want to write musically, also? Yeah, I've I've always done it. I've always had my hands on the board since the uh, first record. You know, when mm -hmm. I didn't really know anything, but I faked it and learned you know as i went along and uh you know the more the more you records you do the more you realize you don't know anything and you still want to keep learning <laughs> so i'm always learning my mind is open to uh all of that to keep keep uh keep the knowledge flowing it's yeah i, I think if you don't take a stand for your music and especially if you if i'm writing it it's not it's different if i somebody else was and i was just doing my little bits mm -hmm. but since i'm i'm writing uh you don't want somebody else to kind of hijack your record you know and uh, there's a lot of producer types or engineer producer people who will do that I, I, I'll, I will take input and say they have a great idea for getting that energy on the record mm -hmm. do that great but sometimes they want to put their own musical stuff in there and um that's something that doesn't really fly with with any of us you know especially yeah. me, me and edward yeah 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 of course you got the next one sable 
Yeah. Uh, speaking of how unique your music is, I find it interesting how you always refer to it as barbaric romantic metal. I was wondering if you like consider that to be like its own unique genre. Uh, I, you know, it's that was just the. Um, I was thinking, you know, what is this stuff that wasn't what you know what 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 do you? It, yeah, it's metal, but it's it's something else as well. So I was thinking, mm-hmm. of, you know, romantic expressionism, uh, you know, barbaric symphonies, you know, whatever. Uh, and it just we sort of arrived at it because I'm influ- influenced by the 19th century school of romantic artists, like be they poets or people like you know in music like Chopin, yeah. Liszt, you know the you know Verdi that kind of thing yeah. so mm-hmm. made sense to me then mm-hmm. so like when I would you that's a really good description for it so like when would you say that you started this barbaric romanticism thing would you say it's like like noble savage because I sort of get those vibes in the title track actually yeah, I think it started there. It may, it may have even started earlier, you know, but it, it really, I think it, it kind of grew up with, with Noble's habits, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like Noble, Noble, and also Angel of Light. And then, you know, the next album, Burning of Rome, Light and Winter, getting that thing. And then it really blossomed, I think, more on the marriage, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so would you say that like uh, tracks like The Redeemer or like Children of the Storm, uh, early stuff with Jack Star, uh, yeah. would you would you say that would sort of be like early incarnations of I, barbaric? Yeah, yeah. I think they were like, you know, I like to say essays in the craft before it was fully sewn, you know, sort yeah. of, yeah, the uh, getting your feet wet and exploring what, what that would be. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. You know, because like, if you look, if you look at that, first record there's a lot of different you know elements on there but, a lot yeah but those uh you know the anchoring tracks are really where we went you know the song burden steel the song children of the storm you know, that's kind of where we ended up yeah and and still in love with you i think you can sort of trace that into like songs like house of dust or uh even uh child of desolation way down the road i think you can sort of tie those in too yeah, I mean, the style was uh, that was okay. Let's do a ballad, but we want to make it aggressive as well, and uh, mm-hmm. that's kind of what we've we've done. And uh, yeah, the music has gotten a lot darker over the years, probably you know since yeah. the first record. Yeah, mm-hmm. life has gotten darker. You know, so <laughs> it's just a reflection. So uh, I want to go back to 1987 with you, and I think it was for the Noble Savage tour. You had the honor to tour with heavy metal giants black sabbath and i just want to know like what's your opinion on uh tony martin as an underrated singer and person he's an excellent singer love his voice mm-hmm. absolutely i love all those records that they did with him yeah yeah excellent especially uh headless cross yeah oh yeah oh yeah, yeah. Right. love that one yeah i love them all they're they're, they're excellent um he was a very nice guy. They were all very, very nice to us on on that uh, that run. Um, I think there was one moment I forget where it was somewhere in Germany where I was there was a uh, piano backstage and Tony Martin and I were banging away and you know trying to write something together you know before the oh. before the gig. Yeah, it was fun. Very, very, very good people. Very nice people. Tony yeah, Martin, absolutely great. And the uh, what really amazed me on that 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 run was. Uh, Oh wait a minute! That's, no, I'm getting that confused with the uh, hold on. This different, different bass player. I, I'm getting that confused with Uriah Heep on the Uriah <laughs> Heep tour. That's that's a few years later. Yeah. The bass player was uh, this guy Trevor Boulder, and I went up to him and said, mm-hmm. "You're Spider from Mars," because he was in Bowie's band. You know, the Spider. And he said, "Oh yes, I was." Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, that was that, pretty cool. That must have been an insane moment, like. Uh... Tony Martin kind of reminds me of like Black Sabbath's version of you because he's a insanely talented musician. He can play multiple instruments. He writes all of his own lyrics. Like I have insane respect for him. He's uh, he's really excellent. He's a super nice guy. I remember there was one one gig where uh, I think he had some some issue with his voice and mm-hmm. uh, I being that my sister is an opera singer, I she she got me into all these. German herbs that are really good to keep the uh, the voice going. So I was back there. I was like, yeah, try this, try this. Yeah. I don't know if he did it or didn't, but he was excellent that night. So whatever. <laughs> of course, it's the Tony Martin show. He, of course, he knocked it out of the park. 
Yeah. Um, so you want to take the next one, Sable? Uh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I wanted to ask you about your, your 1985 album, Nightmare Theater with Exorcist. It sounds so different from your work with Virgin Steel. What made you want to experiment with that type of music? And also, why did you choose the Salem Witch Trials as your inspiration? We really, um, Edward and I really liked, you know, all that sort of uh, thrash things that were going on, that all that early sort of, you know, what, what uh, ended up as black metal stuff like Venom. We used to get, you know, enjoy that okay. kind of thing as well. And uh, actually, we did a gig with Venom and Edward and I were on the side of the stage waiting for them to do Warhead. And they, they, they. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> they were very nice, nice guys. We had a lot of fun with, with Venom. I like them. Um, but yes, yeah, so we we um, we got into doing that. And I, that was not a record I was supposed to do the vocals for. We mm -hmm. had another guy who was actually uh, the bass player on the Pile Driver record, the second one, Stay Ugly. Okay. And it, but he's a very very good singer, and he was going to do it, but. He had this bizarre religious um, epiphany at the end, and he knocked on my door the day we were supposed to do the record. And he said, I, I can't do it. So you know, I had been rehearsing the guys. I knew everything. I wrote those, those vocal lines and all that stuff. So I just went in there and disguised my voice in a way. I sang it a different way. What I wanted to be vocally was uh, a cross between Johnny Rotten, uh, Lemmy, and a, a zombie. And I, I just, I just you know, all, all at once. And I, I had a, uh, I was singing through a beer can in front of the mic. I was drinking, you know, oh, wow. rest, and uh, just sort of did that vocal. And uh, as long as it takes to basically hear the record, we made that record. We made that record in three days. Yeah, fully, yeah. fully done. Um, but yeah, getting back to your other uh, part of what you asked me, Salem Witch Trials. I. I've always been fascinated by that. I went there. It was amazing. I really enjoyed being in this Salem and Marvel head. I don't know. Uh, maybe I was there in another life. Who knows? I don't know. But I've got this thing. We were, um, well, we were, I was in fifth grade in the fifth grade library at my elementary school. They had a book on Salem witch trials. I read the book and I have not been the same since. Yeah. So it just kind of like just bought me, and I, I have, I have, a, I have a, I, in my library, I have lots of books on that subject. Yeah, I'm always reading about that. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever wanted to do another album like that? We actually, Edward and I started actually writing uh, what would have been like the second Exorcist record, but uh, we never, we never got around to doing it. So there are cassette tapes floating around with some of those ideas. <laughs> yeah. So who knows? Here, yeah, maybe, you know, you know, may, many years after, after the fact, who knows, you know. I just find it really interesting how in 1985 you you released Noble Savage and then not even a year later, like way less than a year later, you would go on to uh, actually make this album. And it's such a parallel between Noble Savage and this album. One day you're talk, you're singing about like, don't close your eyes. And then next day you're singing about like, witches and demonic spells and such like and i just love the the sound of it because like i wouldn't ever imagine this is probably the weirdest thing you'll probably ever hear but i would never imagine like joe o'reilly or joey of Babian playing on a speed metal album like it, that's insane to me i no, it wasn't I, joey, it wasn't joey of Babian. It wasn't oh it wasn't no no it was actually a, a gentleman uh his name on the record is jeff pontaine but his real uh, name is uh, Mark Edwards. He's a great, great drama. Uh, he's a good friend of ours, and we've done a lot of um, a lot of gigs with him. He uh, he would always like put these like um, benefit things together, and he would mm -hmm. drag in like me and Edward and and uh, Rob D from from Life in the Ruins, the bass player Rob D, you know. Um, yeah. And we'd do gigs with him and uh, play mostly um, covers and whatnot like that. And actually. We had a band together uh, probably early 2000 to like 2004 with with this guy, Mark, me, Edward, Mark, Josh, and a uh, uh, keyboard player named Lynn Delmato. And it was all pretty much all covers with us, you know, some versions mm -hmm. still in there. But it was all done as if they we had written them. And it was, uh. we, 
we didn't we didn't do any anything in the studio. It was all just live, just a lot of uh, you know, just getting our rocks off and having a good time among friends. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there were conflicting reports about if it was Joey Abazian or that other guy that you mentioned. Uh, so I guess people need to pay attention at home, fix that, and uh, hopefully be all good in the future. Um, yeah, so, Joe, Joe wasn't interested in doing that sort of style. He 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 had he was more of a of a, a, a more into like the John Bonham, you know, Joey yeah. Kramer from Aerosmith that sort of style. You know, he was a very bluesy drummer. I I got that from him. Yeah, he's great drummer. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so while we're at it, since we're talking about uh, your your side uh, projects, of course, um, I want to talk about uh, in the year two thousand, you actually went to sing on the legendary metal bands Aventasia's uh, first single and first album, which it, uh, you, I think you sang late lead vocals on Final Sacrifice and uh, Serpents of Paradise, which are some of my favorite Aventasia songs. So I just want to know, like, uh, what are some things that you remember about, like, Tobias Samet and doing that kind of stuff? Uh, that all... Um, came about because there was a girl working at our label, Sandra. She was a big Vernon Steel fan, and she knew mm -hmm. Tobias, and she um, rang me up one day and said, oh, this guy, he's doing this thing, and uh, he really liked you to do it. And I did it basically because she asked me, you know, because she was really, you know, <laughs> into it and, and whatnot. And I had, she, I'd been on the, um, on these, Oh God, it was crazy when we were doing like marriage and whatnot. They'd fly me over, and then she would drive me all around Germany. We got lost every day, but we had an amazing time. We made every interview, but it was mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. So I, I was very fond of her, and uh, so I did it because she asked me to do it. And basically, it was like I said, well, I, I do have to like the, the, you know what what I'm doing. You know, I got to like mm -hmm. song so. So he always sent me like these little snippets of 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 stuff. So I said, okay, it sounds pretty cool. I didn't hear anything until it was really all done. I mean, I know what I did in, in my areas, and and I didn't know what any, anything else was going on in, in the song. So uh, I just took a day off from we were doing uh, Atrius Act Two at mm -hmm. the moment, and I just took the day off, went into another studio, and and did that, and then sent it off. And I did a lot of background vocals as well as the lead vocals and stuff on there. I just, I, so I sent them all this stuff and then they did whatever they did with it. And I heard it later when, when the record came out. <laughs> awesome. I, I actually absolutely love those songs. So it, 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 it's just like two worlds colliding, just both Aventasia and Virgin Steel. I absolutely love it. Um, also, uh, what do you think about uh, European power metal in general as a genre? Is it something that you enjoy? Yeah, there are bands that I enjoy in that. I don't follow it like people mm -hmm. think that I do. You know, I don't really follow that much of of anything. You know, uh, yeah. So I, I'm not quite aware of what's going on with with every every artist and every band that uh, of course that yeah was. But you know, if I'm open, if somebody says, "Hey, man, you gotta listen to this. Check it out." I'll listen, and you know, generally I'll like it. If somebody is all jazzed up about it. Uh, Yes, I, I have so many, so many things to listen to. Uh, I, I'm still into Chopin. I'm into classical music, and there's so many things I'm still want to learn from that mm -hmm. side of things. And I love, you know, all the stuff that I kind of grew up with. I still love Sabbath. I still love Zeppelin, Queen, yeah. Bowie, T-Rex, and uh, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, so, I, and these days, really, I'm mainly listening to Verdant Steel because I'm always working on stuff. Mm -hmm. so it's like I'm either mixing it or I'm writing it or I'm uh, uh, in the middle of tracking it. So it's, uh, it's you know, you know how sad is that good? All right, yeah, and I'll suck. let's do that again, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Are there any obscure bands that you're a fan of that you think more people should listen to? Obscure bands, uh, well, there is a friend of mine who has an excellent group, a guy named Matthew Knight. He's got a band called Eternal Winter, and he's also been the singer on the last couple of Cauldron Born records. He's a very good singer. Yeah, I know them. Those bands are very good. I, you know, I'd recommend that off the uh, top of my head. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 
I know yeah. Cauldron when they're good. Yeah, his group is called uh, Eternal Winter, and I did, I did a kind of a vocal duet with him on uh, his last album. Nice. I'm gonna have to check that out. Yeah, it's a good track. It's called the uh, Dark Kingdom. Oh, there's a, another guy. There's another guy who's excellent. There's a gentleman named uh, Tommy Vitali. He's an excellent guitar player. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, you probably know who he is. He's a real shredder, amazing player. Yeah, I, yeah. Check out his records. That, that's my kind of style. The sort of shred sort of style. I love it. Um, so, so actually a great segue. Uh, as a guitarist, I, I kind of want to talk about Edward Pierzino, who is becoming one of my favorite guitarists, honestly. Uh, I love his sort of blend of the, the shredder style. Of course, he can do that stuff. But also, he has a very unique sense of melody, and he sort of blends them together to fit the song specifically, it seems like. Like, like it's like he could not have written it any better when I listened to his solos. Uh, so I just want to ask you, like, what are some of your favorite uh, Edward Pierzino uh, guitar passages or solos? Uh Oh God, there's so many, you know, I mean, I, I, I've been working with Edward since uh, we're like 15 years old, you know, mm -hmm. so we go back before Virgin Steel, you know, yeah. uh, it was really inevitable that he would end up being in Virgin Steel. I actually um, tried to get him into Virgin Steel with the original Jack when Jack was in the band, but it mm -hmm. didn't quite work out. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was, it was destined that we were going we to work together and, and and be in a band together and travel around the world and, and make records, and that's what we did. Um, I really like the solo on I Wake Up Screaming. That's just a real sh of course. type of yeah. solo that I really like. I'm off, off the uh, top of the old brain. I, I, all, all of the solos are, are really, really good. He He's unique in, in, the, in the fact that um, he likes working with me on solos. He likes mm -hmm. when, you know, I, I say, we can go here, try this, try that. And, and he likes to bring in to the solos the vocal melodies on there. So we, we've always been started in doing that. Uh, and he comes from different roots than a lot of people do today. I mean, he's really into like, a, he was really growing up into a Jimmy Page, mm -hmm. a Richie Blackmore, that sort of thing. Uh, he, he, you know, he wasn't like an Ingve guy. He, uh, he appreciated Ingve and all that stuff, but that's not his thing. Uh, and he likes a lot of the blues guys that I like, you know, so, uh, people who played with Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, that kind of thing. And, um, it was our thought, because we listened to the, uh, first and second Led Zeppelin albums a lot, that you should never know exactly where the voice and the guitar trail off. They blend together and, and and make this one thing. And that's what we have arrived at over the over the years doing that. So there's a lot of inter voice and inter guitar play going on. Yeah, definitely. Um had a lot in like your repeating themes in the music. I was wondering if you like write the themes out first and then work them into all your specific songs later. Uh, the, the, you know, those themes, like, for example, all those themes like, that, are, that flow throughout the marriage and Invictus, you know, they, they're derived from the initial spark of whatever the, whatever song they initially, are, you know, appeared in. And then I developed them and took them into other places. So you could, so like an opera would do, you know, have these ideas where, yeah, yeah where a theme would, would, would um, represent either a mood, a character, an event, and then if it's like, if it's a human being, what is that human being going through? And then as they go through their strangeness, then the then the, the uh, theme gets, you know, mutated and, and changed, transformed, if you will. Yeah, and that's, that was the idea. Yeah. yeah. So I just want to talk about like one of my favorite songs of all time. I've mentioned it already. Uh, the Burning of Rome, which is off your Age of Incentive album. Uh, Really, I, I would just play it over, 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 and over again, like sometimes like three times per day, It like just during school while I'm working. And uh, I, I just wanna, like I have ideas of what it's about, but I just want you to sort of 
explain it what you were what you're going through and, and what you were like what you had in mind when you were writing it okay i hope i don't ruin it for you <laughs> no hope definitely not do you want me to share my own uh, interpretation of it yeah please do yeah so i'm thinking it's about a soldier who's alone at war uh, a legionary if you will because it's rome and i think you're using the eruption of mount vesuvius as a metaphor for a dying rome and how he's talking about how he misses his family and how that can tie into being a musician like yourself on way on tour something like that a little bit i don't know if i got that right <laughs> that's, all, that's all a factor in there yeah i was thinking about okay i want to i want to write something about this 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 guy he's he's out there wherever he is uh and he's definitely going towards death mm -hmm. and he's thinking about uh his his woman and uh the seed that's planted in there that he's yes. going to be born later on i'll see you i'll meet you again through the eyes of us hunt that, of course. that yeah. idea so yeah uh it's it's really i was being metaphorical for all the all the great losses of the world like the library of alexandria all, all that kind of thing mm -hmm. was factoring into my brain and that uh that idea of that song i brought that back into perfect mansions it's really could be like same story same guy same idea yeah mm. yeah because i show that song to absolutely everyone that i know and actually to my surprise they love it because a lot of my friends don't actually like like metal but they they love that song and, and i think it's really a powerful song in that way and it i think it'll stand the test of time really right. thanks i hope so <laughs> yeah all right about my favorite version of steel song emily uh where that idea came from because when i've been reading about the mythology besides nine some of your songs every time i try to look that one up i can't find anything about it is the story in the name your own invention yeah that is not it's, it's, it's not mythological yeah yeah that's just something i invented um i like the okay. sound of it you know how it rolls out of the mouth yeah. uh, and i was thinking about everyone is searching for this you know this this you know uh, divine love from from that can transcend beyond the grave you know that you know we're unconditional you know unconditional acceptance and uh yeah just something that never never dies that 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 union which you can you know where one mind one body one spirit melts with the other one and uh makes one, two elements coming together, making that third idea that I speak about a lot. Uh, that's what I was looking for in that song. And I think, I think it, uh, it, 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 it worked, it worked. Where did you come up with the name? Did you, does it have a meaning or did you just like the sound of it? I was just, just, you know, fumbling around, you know, scatting around as I, as I, as I do when I'm singing. And uh, I had like something like, you know, maybe some, some other M of this or M of that or something, whatever. And then I just fused um, things together and until it, it was that. So, oh, yeah, that, that's got a bit of a ring to it. Let's go with that. Yeah. And that was one of those things that I, I wrote the initial like opening verse area and then it was like oh my god where do i go from there i just you know it was like you know block not block but like you know oh my, my what am i gonna do and then like a week later aha here i go and then the road was clear and i was off and running and it ended up being nine minutes so yeah yeah <laughs> well it worked out in the end because that's a fucking amazing song i must say thanks man thanks. the entire album really um so that actually brings me to another thing where uh, you have this theme in the marriage albums and of course later on also um, where you have the marriage of heaven and hell theme, you know, the da -na 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 -na. yeah, that whole thing. Um, so we see it happening all the way through the marriage albums and of course through the, oh, it's also in the Atreus albums and there's traces of it in Visions of Eden also. Yep. So I want to know like what's the benefit for the listener uh, with uh, not repeating, but sort of reintroducing that theme over and over again. I think it's like it's like a like a um, um, maybe for some it's like a, a favorite blanket or a pair of jeans, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. 
I'm I'm back, you know. So it, it lets them know we are still involved with our roots and we are still there. There are many branches on the tree, but those roots are still there and, and off we, we go, kind of kind of a thing. You know, that was mm -hmm. and it and if it it may have suggested like some um a th throwback idea to whatever mood that was where, where I used it, you know, that particular individual or something. Of course, of course. Uh, so would you say that your concept albums uh, strictly follow the concepts or would you say that they're more loosely defined and you take some creative licenses? I think it's it's there's a looser approach. Yeah, yeah, because mm -hmm. I, I I like to uh, my mind does work in in the around the idea of concept, you know. But even Age of Consent was kind of a concept album in a way. I mean, it was it had to do with you know youth and aging and all that sort of stuff. And um, mm -hmm. so it's all in there, even though if it's not in every song. It's almost like like even like uh, if you if you listen to Ziggy Stardust and uh, that album Bowie, mm -hmm. uh, people think oh it's just concept album it isn't really it sort of is you know but there are things that relate to it and it's so like age was more like like a record like that noble savage is more like a record like, like that where, where there is these ideas but it goes in other other areas so yeah so there's um i did connect as best as i was able the ideas that i wanted to and there is a through line that you know brings it all all there mm -hmm. but yeah you can you can also i always wanted to be able to take out extract from the from the record and say okay they can stand on their own without the story it still is just you know it's a rock song a metal song whatever and it you know it doesn't need you don't need to know everything that's going on to still get into it mm -hmm. which is a you know a tricky road to uh, to drive of course of course uh, i had a related question to that how much of the marriage of heaven and hell albums are based on or inspired by william blake's poem the marriage of heaven and hell not very much yeah um <laughs> i didn't even read that until we were almost done with uh the second one. Uh, oh wow the only thing i knew about blake was songs of innocence and songs of experience that were in my oh my, yeah my father's library so i read those and they're little short little things uh yeah so, so we had done marriage one finished it cd was out and uh joey was no longer working with us the drama and so we needed to get there is yeah so we needed to get a new drama and this gentleman named frank gilchrist came over to my place and uh he wanted to audition and I gave him that CD that, that uh, Austin just held up there, Marriage One. And he was, goes, oh, William Blake. And I go, what do you mean, William Blake? And he says, yeah, he's got this, you know, this epic poem. And I was like, I, I didn't know it, you know. So I, I showed him you know, what I did know of Blake, which was those songs of innocence and experience. He says, no, you, you should read this one. I said, oh, all right. So he went and learned, learned that record and auditioned for us and, you know, ended up being the drummer. But, uh, and I went ahead and, uh, read that but the largely the, the the second album was was done we were doing both records at once so he ended up playing drums on emily crown of glory and prometheus which drew the last three that we had to do because everything else was already done so yeah. well i guess it was the other way around i i had read the poem before i listened to your album so i had just assumed from the name is it such a famous poem that you would base the albums off of the poem? I just like the idea of, again, bringing things together. I said, what can I do that's the most opposite? Oh, heaven and hell, and I'll, I'll, I'll marry them. Yeah. <laughs> so that's where the uh, title came from. Yeah, so, it, was, it, was, it was arrived from, we had just done Life Among the Ruins. Edward and I were sitting in my vehicle, and we we're going, okay, what am I going to do next? And I said, I think, you know, I'm, I'm writing a lot of stuff, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. Uh, that's really, you know, goes out there. It's more like Burning of Rome, more like that stuff. And I had written uh, I Will Come For You and, and whatnot, which I then showed him. And uh, he was like, you know, flabbergasted. He loved that idea. He loved the song. And uh, we were off and running. I was writing things. And then together, we wrote a bunch of stuff like Weeping of the Spirits, um, uh, 
uh, we're screaming, and so on and so on, and uh, and that and just it snowballed from there, and there was enough for two records. Yeah. So I just want to talk about like one of the most underrated parts of probably Virgin Steel, Life Among the Ruins. Yeah. Hey. Either, either original American CD and the Steam Hammer uh, reissue. Cool. And uh, I I just want to talk about like people were. I read in the liners of the Steam Hammer uh, reissue that some people were probably expecting a follow up to the Burning of Rome or songs such as Noble Savage and uh, like what what inspired you or what made you choose the path that you took on Life Among the Ruins as opposed to like a more epic approach. You know, we were really we were jamming a lot, and as we were you know jamming away, we would end up doing like Zeppelin covers and whatever, and it just felt really good. And it was kind of our roots. And, uh, you know, so when I started writing, when Edward and I started writing together, uh, the music just had more of that flavor of what we were doing. And uh, the rhythm section really liked, they liked that better than than uh, than the kind of uh, epic metal stuff, especially uh, mm -hmm. drama. And so, uh, you know, we wanted to, uh, do something where everyone would really enjoy it. And uh, that was what uh, developed those those songs. Yeah, at that point. So it started started there and uh, I have no regrets about it. You know, I, I really like that record. It just was oh, yeah. a reflection of what we were doing. And it's another it's another string to our bow. I'm a I'm a blues guy. I love the blues, you know, mm -hmm. we got back to that again a little bit on some of the nocturnes album mm -hmm. and some of the ghost uh, harvest stuff you know uh, you know you can take the kid out of the blues you can't take the blues out of the kid you know, that's of course it. of course <laughs> um but yeah I, I really love that album even though it's not like epic power metal like which you got a bunch of flack for back in the day of course oh, yeah. um oh, yeah. but um it just has that certain kind of charm to it. Like your your vocals are really emotive. Edward's guitar playing is very, very melodic, probably some of the most melodic stuff he's ever done. Your keyboarding is your keyboard skills are on point. The rhythm section is absolutely amazing. Uh, some of my favorite songs actually are from Life on the Ruins, like uh, Never Believe in Goodbye, uh, Too Hot Too Hot to Handle, um, Wildfire Woman. I just love all those songs and I think you did a knock-up job on that album. Thanks, thanks. That was, you know, when we were doing gigs in the States a lot around that that uh, era. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when we were doing, like, more of the noble era stuff and aged uh, stuff, uh, people didn't always get it. But when we started doing that record, everyone was like, oh, this, you're great, we love you in the States. But in Europe, it was a different story because they were expecting something else. I think if another band had done that record, it wouldn't have gotten the plaque, you know, if that was their debut album, you know, but that's it. It's all about like people want to sometimes put you in a box and you're that's, you know, I'm not going in any box unless I'm dead. I'm, you know, we're not about that. Thing. You know, it's got, I don't like uh, being imprisoned in any way, shape or form. That's getting back to Dionysus. That's what that album also deals with, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not being boxed in being, it's very anti-authority because I am very anti-authority. You know, I think with, Having great freedom comes great. You have to have great respect as well mm -hmm. for for others around you, and, and and great responsibility that you're not damaging somebody else, but you can still be free within that sphere. Of course, of course. What's your favorite book or piece of literature that you've never written a song about, and do you plan to write a song about one in the? Hmm. That's a very good question. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I think I really love Ray Bradbury. He's one of my one of my guys. I I, I love his short stories and his novels. Everything. Yeah. Uh, Ray Bradbury. Yeah. Yeah, I've read a little bit of him. He's got a. He's very famous for um, a book called Paranoid Four Fifty One, which is about firemen burning books rather than. You know, putting yeah. out fires. They made some movies. Yeah, I read that last year. That's a really good one. Excellent. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, that that would make a good song or a good album or something like that. But yeah, there's mm -hmm. probably other works uh, by him that uh, I would maybe choose 
Uh, he's got this one called uh, Death is a Lonely Business, which is a kind of like a noir kind of a book. Yeah, interesting book. Yeah, I'd recommend that one. I haven't read that one. You might enjoy it. Yeah, I'll look into it. I hope you decide to make a song of it someday. I will do. I will do something of 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 that, perhaps. Yeah, he's uh, he's one of my favorites because his language is so usually so poetic. Always, you know, it's not just this yeah. happened and that. It's all uh, it's all poetic. It's operatic. It's 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 just it's the uh, it's it's life. It's it, it it just glows with life. His his work. And I almost met him. He was in um, an area not far from where I live. And I missed him by just a, a little bit. I would have loved to have met him. He was at a book signing thing. Oh. Yeah. He'd be like over 100 now, you know, if he was still alive. Yeah. 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 So I just want to talk a little bit about uh, your influence. We t your influences. Uh, we touched up about uh, about this earlier a little, a little bit, but I want to dive a little bit deeper into it. Um, so way back at way back in the noble savage days, you experimented with progressive funk, um, or even progress or speed slash thrash sort of styles. But in recent years, on the Ghost Harvest albums, you have uh, experimented with like sort of uh, uh, what's the word for it? Like Delta blues, like Robert Johnson sort of Muddy Waters, of course. Yeah. Um, so I just want to know, like, or even making like orchestral pieces of uh, old songs, you do that too. Um, what influences would you say have the biggest effect on you? I mean, growing up, all that sort of thing. Uh, just, uh, in, just in general, very good, really. I, I mean, my roots are, are definitely um, in the first and second Zeppelin album, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, then, so I, I really like that. So, well, what were they listening to? So then I discovered Muddy Waters and, you know, Robert Johnson and uh, mm -hmm. Elm James and, and the list goes on, Howlin' Wolf. Uh, but also, I really, really, really was very much inspired by uh, the early Queen records, especially the second one, you know, Side Black, with mm -hmm. much of the Black Queen and all that. And I was like, wow. I mean, just like the vocal arrangements were like outstanding and just everything about, about the record. I love everything about that record. Um, and I was like, wow, yeah, that's uh, that's where I want to go uh, compositionally and fuse that other thing from the Zeppelin to that and uh, go from this. So that's that's I was properly like the, that and um, Chopin. Yeah. And Debussy, those guys from from the uh, piano side. Yeah. Probably the biggest influences from for me you know, growing up and f fueled me. And then, you know, then you go from there and. And you you know, have add more and more strings to your bow and get more. You know, I, I discovered uh, some years ago the Rite of Spring by Stravinsky, and that you know that that was like really a revelation for me. You know, so uh, yeah. And my sister was like showing, uh, doing opera, so showing me, oh, check out this, check out that opera, check out the other thing, and yeah, yeah it went on. It goes and it still goes on. You know, from there. Yeah, I was a mad T Rex guy growing up. You know. Alice Cooper, I loved, you know, also. Oh, Alice Cooper, yeah. I yeah, him. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so in an interview from, I think it was 2000, around the Atreus sort of era, you said that you were working on uh, these five albums at the same time. And, uh, of course, later in the later 2010s, you said you were working on the Ghost Harvest albums, plus you were remastering and remixing stuff, of course. Um, I want to know, like, how do you work on all that at the same time? Like, how do you stay grounded? Uh, how do you, how, basically, how do you not go insane, really? Which you, you kind of are, but... You do go insane. You, you do. do go insane. And, and, I, and I, I, I always go over the edge at some point where I'm like, I'm like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just like, ah, enough, stop, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, is after a while nothing sounds right to me, you know, so I have to get away from it. And then I'll go to the beach, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll you know, grab that bottle of wine, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. off, I, off I go and try to, you know, remove myself. But it's, I only do that for a short bit because I am, there's a line from the song uh, By the Hammer of Zeus, pain is me and I'm relentless. I am mm -hmm. relentless. So I just 
harness myself and I go back in there and just beat myself and I just work and work until uh, until it starts to uh, sound good again and work, work, you know, yeah, that's it basically. And I mean, I'm driven because I do, I do enjoy it so much. I mean, I love, I love listening back to when it, ah, it's all together now, this part, this part, they're there. And then, then you sequence the record and, it, and it's, it's making its story known. So both of those reasons i i am i am nuts i am relentless and i am driven because i'm uh, i love it also so all all of, all of the above and then some yeah but it's not easy no it's not easy because <laughs> yeah. most people uh they say oh it, it this work's killing me it's too much but with you it, it seems like if you're not working like that's what will uh make you go insane and that you kind of remind me of my father a little bit in that, like where you always have to be doing something or else you're not really feeling fulfilled. And yeah, I want to earn my keep. I want to I want to max out my my body, my mind, my voice while I am standing in front of you on the on this earth, you know, mm -hmm. because I'm not going to be here forever. I know that, you know, and, uh, you know, part of my life, part of what fuels me is is that, you know, so. Uh, I'm diving and getting it done now while I'm able to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. Of course, of course. Go ahead, Sable. Want you? Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, what are some of your favorite songs to perform live? In individual songs by different artists, you mean? No, uh, what are some of your favorite of your songs oh, to perform my... live? Uh, Emily is one, definitely. Yeah, Burning nice. Walls is, is one. Uh, uh, just about everything on this new album is I really like the Ritual of Descent, Spiritual Warfare. Uh, there's, a, there's a really interesting song called Unio Mystica on the record. Uh, the Girl with the Grave Deep Eyes. It's ballad-esque, you know, gothic -y. Um uh, Oh my God, I really love from the last couple of records we did, um, uh, Psychic Slaughter, Green Dust Blues. I mean, it's a different vibe, but uh, yeah, those are, you know, I, I like Green Dust Blues as much as I like, you know, Noble. You know, I mean, you know, whatever whatever reason, you know, that's that's the thing. Those that that those records, those three that those, let me say this: those three records that were new on that box set are new records. A lot of people didn't get mm -hmm. that. Yeah, there were three new records in there. People thought it was all just reissue stuff. No, those were three yeah. new records that we did. Uh, so um there's a lot those are real like like ruins like the ruins album those those records are really highly personal you know to what goes on in, in my life you know uh so i really like those records yeah uh man we're like almost halfway like we're almost done um so Okay, so I I want to throw a hypothetical at you. So you're you're a big uh, fan of Roman and uh, Greek history, of course. Uh, I just want to know who would you think would win in like a, a pitch battle with their own armies, Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great? Oh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think Alexander. Yeah. Alexander. Yeah. He didn't lose a single battle. I I think. So I think that's what makes him sort of unique in that way. He was, yeah, he was, uh, he was a wild man. Yeah, he, he almost, uh, he almost conquered the whole world. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or, or basically what was the earth at the time, right? Yeah, so, what was the known world at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you sort of like, like riding horses like Alexander did? What you I haven't written, written in a while, but I, I did like riding horses. Yeah, you know, and I did ride that uh, big beast. A noble beast that's on the Visions of Eden album. Yeah, yep. Nicholas, his name was that horse. He was a Frisian horse, huge, huge, huge guy. Massive horse, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It's even, it's even bigger than that sword that you were handing, holding. Yeah, yes. it's insane. Yes, 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 yes. He was a huge, huge, huge guy, and he had a, he had a, uh, just had a stone removed from his hoof, so he was oh. he was not in the greatest mood when I first met him. So I had to like give him apples for about an hour and kind of like get to know him and talk gently with him and and then then he allowed me to write him. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
So I can sort of tell that you're you're sort of like an an animal person, uh, like we are. And I, as a fellow animal lover, um, what are some of your favorite animals? And do you really have any pets? I do. I have five cats at the moment. Yeah. Cats. Wow. Yes, I I'm really a cat guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. People call me the I'm a crazy cat lady. Yeah, that's that's me. Yeah. yeah. You might be. You might yeah, be. I, I think I am. Yeah, I had eleven at one point. You know. Uh, oh, wow. yeah, yeah, well, some of them were outside. They would not come in, but I had eight living inside and the rest were outside. Um, yeah, so it, it fluctuates because, you know, they they speak these these cats outside and then they tell other people and then they show up. And then like one one that's inside now, I uh, jumped in my lap. I was on the uh, porch. And I was like, I was really gentle. It's going like like this on my my leg. I, I look at it, wait a minute, he has no claws. Somebody declawed him and dumped him out. So I had to bring him in. Wow. Now he's in, you know, so that's how it goes, you know. <laughs> just, just to declaw a cat and just throw it out on its own. That No, cats not, can't not, really live like that, right? Not a good idea. No, not a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's where we part ways. I'm more of a dog person, so. <laughs> I love them. I love them as well. I, yeah. I love dogs. Ch chickens, whatever you got. They're all great. There, there's never a bad day. Our, our drummer's got is got a turtle and a dog. He, he they, and they're friendly with each other. Yeah. Yeah. There's never a bad day with a dog when you you, you come home and they're just pawing up on you like daddy's home. You know. Yeah. yeah. Like cats will do that too. Cats will yeah. do it. <laughs> I, I've never seen uh, my my dad's cat ever do that to me. So. Well, very different, you know, and it, it, but they do that. Uh, he did that with me. Yeah, yeah. They jump, they jump on you, leap on your back when you're walking by, all kinds mm -hmm. of stuff. Yep. I, I would wake up and my grandma's cat would just be laying on top of me and I'll, I'll be like, oh, what's happening? Yeah, it's great. It's nice. Yeah. And, yeah. That, and the uh, her that they make is very therapeutic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good for the ears. Yeah. So I also want to talk a little bit about your stage presence. Uh, so you so what in certain songs, not in all songs, of course, but in certain songs, you'll be having a keyboard part and then you'll also be singing or like during a, a, a verse or something where you're not playing keyboards, you take the sort of microphone off and move around, interact with the crowd, get up on their face. Um, and I, I can't help but draw a parallel between uh, you and uh, Freddie Mercury, who also did that. Would you say that he's a big influence on your sort of... Uh, your, your appearance or like your stage presence. Yeah, I learned that from Freddie that you could do that. You could, you know, you sit down and do your bed, get up and, and, and what, whatnot. I, I always stood at the keyboard because it was easier to, to mm -hmm. get up and whatever. But uh, actually playing is easier sitting down. I prefer that, but I, I was never afforded that opportunity. <laughs> so I just did what yeah. I did. Yeah, uh, yeah, sometimes you really need that bit so you got to do it so you do it and then you could let some of the stuff go by the wayside because it doesn't need to always be there i always felt that the records were the records and live was live and and mm -hmm. they didn't have to meet and i learned that from queen freddie and you know queen and 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 zeppelin also you know, the records were sometimes very very um full of all sorts of extra instruments but live of it was just th those those guys you know yeah, yeah like like sort of the recorders in stairway to heaven and all of that I don't know if he actually did that live though. If John Paul Jones did that live. Oh yeah, that's all. That's all done with the Mellotron. Oh yeah. Mellotron. Okay, okay. okay. So John Paul Jones. He, he was able to do a lot of things that he did in the studio, on stage because he's a very versatile, very talented guy. Of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I just I not too long ago I saw uh, the I don't know if it's a cover band tribute band of their of John Bonham's son, uh, Jason Bonham's band. Oh yeah, uh, have you ever seen them live? I, I thought yes. they were great. Yes. yes, they were excellent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it it's amazing how their singer could has pipes like uh, Robert Plant did. Like I was surprised by that. Yeah, yeah, he was very. I, I don't know if it's the same guys, but I saw them maybe three or four years ago. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I saw them like half a year ago or something like that. Um, but Jason, he drums just like his father does. It's insane. That's why they used him. Yeah, they brought him yeah. back, you know, for the for that stuff. Yeah, he was uh, he was there watching, you know, when the, when it was all going down and learning from his dad. Yeah, it's it's almost like you could feel John Bonham there in in him. Like it's it's insane. It's a great feeling. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so also, uh, you were on this, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but back in 2015, during the Nocturne's time, of course, um, you were on Brutally Delicious Productions, making Penne of the Fearless. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. And uh, you ever, you also talked about uh, the Atreus albums, how it's it's all a tragedy and all of that. Um, but also, what are some other dishes that, as a resident Italian, of course, um, that uh, you love making? Oh, I cook. I cook every night. I, I love cooking. I mean, I like going out to dinner also. And mm -hmm. uh, it's a wonderful Italian restaurant that's five minutes from me so I can go there. And, and they, the guy is very friendly there. gives me wine when I sit down the <laughs> house and all that. It's great. But uh, I cook uh, quite, quite a bit. And these days I've really gotten into, uh, I'm not a vegetarian per se, but I'm going that way, you know. Uh, so I've been eating... I haven't been really eating much meat at all. I've been going with um, these. Uh, I sound like I'm going to be a, 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 an endorsement for this. Uh, beyond beyond meat stuff, beyond burgers, beyond sauce, yeah. all that stuff, and the impossible ones, you know. So I've been cooking a lot with with those things. I'm I've been also exploring um, like um, red lentil spaghetti, that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. You know, the different pastas and whatnot. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really fond of that sort of food, but trying to do it now without so much of the, uh, the meat going on, you know, what, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I'm into chopping up all sorts of insane vegetables and putting them together with, uh, penne or spaghetti or, uh, mm -hmm. or wh whatever, even this, um, what is, they get like zucchini and they spiral it up and, and you just use that instead of the actual, uh, spaghetti. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty neat as well. Whatever, I, I, I'm. There's not really many food that I that I don't like, but I am allergic to lobster. I won't eat that. Yeah. Yeah. As a fellow Italian, I I felt like I was contractually obliged to ask that question, because uh, of course we love food of any sort, really. Um, but also, you said you also mentioned uh, pasta Vesuvius. Will you ever be oh. making that? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I, I, I should do another cooking show. I, I enjoy that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I make a lot of uh, pasta pizzelli, you know, pasta chichi, pasta, mm -hmm. chichi, all the all the so-called peasant dishes or what my favorite. Yeah. yeah, that stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. The, the Suvius is, you know, if you like things hot, I do, you know, red pepper, crushed red pepper, sliced red pepper, any kind of pepper that's boiling and lava-esque. Yeah, yeah. Big fan of that. Sable, you have, have a follow-up question. Making, yeah, I was going to say, have you ever thought of making your own Virgin Steel-themed cookbook? I, I'm another Italian, and I also love your pasta dish recipes. I would I would not mind doing that. It could be fun. I do make a lot of things that are, you know, that are one-offs. It's never, like, done the same way because I'm always improvising. That's what I love from the blues, all this improvising and whatnot. And uh, yeah. so... Cooking is good for that. So, uh, yeah, I'd have to really like like film it in the moments and shoot what I did. But uh, I would always, you know, have that caveat that do your own thing, spice it your own way, do your, your own bit with it. Yeah, yeah. This is just the basic start. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm going to Italy next year with my family uh, to sort of retrace my, our roots and sort of enjoy the culture that we uh, derive from. And I was wondering uh, if you have any sort of pointers that you want to give us as to the Italian culture or customs. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Well, um, generally, there's no tipping involved over there. If you go if you're fine dining, you know, they, mm -hmm. they're all kind of included. Um, where are you going in, in, in Italy? Oh, we're, we're taking like a tour, uh, two week tour of the country. We're starting down in Sicily in, in the south where my family and Sable's family are from. And we're going up north through all the cities, of course, that are in the peninsula, like uh, Brundis Brundisium, as the ancient name is. Uh, we got Rome, uh, Milan, Florence, stuff like that. Even, okay. yeah. Yeah, so, yeah well, uh, Florence is just amazing. You know, the, uh, the old bridge, the Ponte Vecchio is amazing. Mm -hmm. Some, all, the, all the art by Benvenuto Cellini, you see all that stuff. And the Statue of David is there. And uh, yeah. it's just, you're know, walking around those streets. It's like... Yeah, you know, walking around there, you really feel like 
you're in the visual equivalent of like um, a epic power metal record kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So, right, right there, you know, and doing gigs there, you really feel like, yeah, you're 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 enmeshed with the scenery. It's, it's amazing. So I recommend men that all those areas that you mentioned, you know, they're really known for not only, of course, the uh, pastas and whatnot, but the, mm -hmm. the meats, they're really big on the meats. So, I mean, it's kind of like if it's there, you know, and uh, and if you're not, you know, uh, allergic to it, you, you might want to try some of that stuff. Yeah, it's pr pretty, pretty amazing. One of the most uh, credible <laughs> amazing moments I had on, on the road in Italy was we were on the road with I think it was uh, I believe it was us Hammerfall and uh, Freedom Hall and we're backstage in, in Rome in this huge huge area and there was this very 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 old Italian woman with this massive I mean massive vat of sauce and she was stirring like this stirring like this and she was smoking and she had the cigarette and the ash was like out to here over the sauce. And I was just waiting for it to drop into the sauce, but it, it never did. It was incredible. And she just <laughs> I'll never okay. forget that. Okay. You got any more questions, Sable? So yeah, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your sword collection? Like what are some of your swords that are like have sentimental value to you or which your swords are like the oldest or most valuable or anything like that? Yeah, the one that's probably the most dear to me is the one I had made for me. It's the one that's on the cover of the Wait for the Night EP. I don't know if you know that, the American Yep, yep. Uh, that one. That was made by a crazy mad genius. He was supposed to make me something that was going to be light and be able to throw up in the air on stage yeah. or whatever. But he made me this thing that's like, it's like 80 some odd pounds it's like ridiculous mm -hmm. and you just look at it wrong and you can uh, get injured by it i actually broke my toe on it last summer because uh, i didn't realize it was where it was it was in the dark and boom right into it yeah uh but that's that's very uh, very dear to me that one uh and then i have some old old roman uh antique ones that i that i really enjoy and I'm glad I, you said it's yeah there's one yeah. oh actually the, maybe i can grab it it's not too far hold on of course. A this is awesome. <laughs> this guy here, this guy here is a is an is an ancient guy here, very old that uh, was in my family for uh, a long, 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 long while. This guy hanging on the wall. Yeah, it looks like a. Um, I I forgot what it what exactly they called them, but like the Roman cavalry swords, the the spatas. How, yes. How do you say it? something of that nature and i got this guy this was like this was a gift from from uh josh from verdant steel yep great player yeah this one yeah oh that's beautiful yeah. well, that's awesome I, I love i love the sheath also yeah it's it's definitely it's got this nice writing on it and whatnot i don't know if you can see that but uh, it's kind of you know well, blinded by the light there yeah i can kind of see it yeah some engravings yeah There's a, uh, a crossbow I've got. There's a, uh, and there's a mace I've got. Some not in this room. Yeah. So yeah. A mace. It's a, wow. It's okay. about like uh, maybe twenty something swords now. I, I think. Yeah. Sometimes people give you things. I've got. I got a uh, samurai sword on, on on the road. Somebody gave me once in uh, Portugal. I believe it was Portugal. Cool. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Yeah. That's pretty insane. Yeah, you could give stuff like like swords or, or wine usually we get you know that kind of thing yeah yeah i've always thought about collecting stuff but i unfortunately i spend all my money on guitar stuff so guitar and computer stuff so. there. i see them in the in the in the room there you got like a bunch i see them your guitars oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. uh you want me to show you some of them sure yeah awesome i'll be right back okay Oh, Les Paul. So this one's probably one of my favorites. Um, this is a Les Paul given to me by my father. Um, yeah. It has a sort of a darker finish. Um, I just love the sound of sound of Les Pauls and. Definitely. Ed, I know Ed's a huge fan of Les Pauls. He he plays them all the time. Um, 
Yeah, he used to uh, have have won a gold top, but uh, it got destroyed. Yeah, yeah. Now he's an SG guy. Yeah. And this is also special to me because um, this is the song I learned the Burning of Rome solo on. So it it, it took some time to learn it, uh, a bunch of headaches, but I, I got it down. Uh, I yeah. It, Excellent. It, Absolutely yes. amazing. All right. All right. What about you, Sable? What do you do? Play? You play at all? I can play piano a little bit. But that's honestly about it. I have a bass guitar, but I haven't learned how to play it yet. I oh. do more writing and drawing than playing music. All right. Well, maybe Austin can show you some bits on the bass. Yeah. 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 We talked about yeah, that maybe. before. Yeah. yeah. I would like to learn how to play bass. Great instrument. Great instrument. It yeah. It's an, I'll, I'll say this about bass, it's a easy instrument to sort of learn, but to master it is extremely hard because um, you can get away, of course, with just playing like root notes and such, as David probably probably knows. But um, of course, there's also that harmonic stuff that you, you kind of want to throw in because you don't want it to be yeah. too stale, depending on what you're writing, of course. But yeah. yeah. If you want to be a master, you know, on whatever it is, you gotta you gotta put the effort in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, of course. Um, so I also have an, another hypothetical for you that you might actually like. Um, so if you were to form a band with any Greek god or goddesses, like you, okay, let's say uh, you can be any instrument you want. You can play any instrument what you want, but it can only be let's say a, a max of two instruments like your vocals and piano or whatever okay uh who would you have in your band with you and like what kind of music would you play etc cetera, etc cetera? with with the greek gods or and goddesses gods. yeah okay hmm. that's a good uh, no one's ever asked me that one uh i guess you, you you'd probably need zeus maybe maybe zeus would have to play drums uh drums oh the, yeah that would work <laughs> Dionysus would have to play uh, um, maybe bass, you know, growing things from the earth, you know, yeah, kind of thing. Uh, and we'd need, um, uh, I would say, uh, on second, on guitar, we didn't get to that. Yes, guitar would be, uh, uh, maybe Aphrodite would be on guitar. Yeah, something like that would be good. And uh, um, then we need uh, like another keyboard player or second guitar. So maybe um, Athena, some wisdom Athena? in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wisdom Definitely. in the group. need some wisdom in the group. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, also, uh, crap, I forgot what I was about to say. It just escaped me. Um, what kind of music would you guys play? Like, would you guys play like polka blues or something? <laughs> <laughs> uh i think it would have to be like barbaric romantic <laughs> of course of course in that, would it... that uh, in that uh incarnation uh something like a cross between uh you know uh, maybe as bluesy as like uh jet black but but uh in and, and rome dionysus album era stuff that kind of thing yeah mm -hmm. yeah influenced by greek music at all uh was was that have you been influenced by Greek music at all, or just Greek mythology? I like the Greek music, yeah, you know, because you, you 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 hear it when you're in the restaurants, you know, the bazooki stuff going on. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, and uh, everybody joins in, is banging on tables and screaming and hollering. It's 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 definitely exciting. Yeah, I wouldn't mind bringing some of that into like into a record at some point. Yeah, that kind of thing. I did know one guy. We spoke a little bit about it. Uh, played uh, that kind of bazooka style guitar. Uh, so maybe, who knows? Oh, that would be interesting. Be interesting, yeah, a little uh, um, added thing to the uh, to the metal. Yeah. I know one of my favorite bands, Warlord, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. Their guitarist does have a, have a lot of uh, Greek influences in his guitar playing. Mm-hmm. I'm only familiar with uh, that one song they did, like like years and years ago. Yeah, I don't really know much of Warlord. Was it Child of the Damned or yeah, that, Us from Evil? That one, yeah, that one, yeah. Child of the Damned, yeah, that's an amazing song. That's probably my favorite by them, too. Yeah. Excellent, 
Excellent. So that I mean, that's basically all the questions that I have for you, uh, Sable. If you right. had any more. No, I don't think I had any others. Yeah, we don't want we don't want to keep you for too long, as we know you're you're a busy guy, of course, with this new album coming out. Which uh, let's re let's recap that a little bit. Um, oh. Passion of it. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, David. Um, but coming out on June 30th. Make sure you pre-order it. I pre-ordered mine. Um, cool. You can get it on CD or L LP form at Steam Hammer or yes. other online re retailers. Yes. Um, so, yeah, basically that's it. Watch the new Lyric video. There'll be another one coming out, as David said. Yes, there will be one in, in June, and there'll, actually there'll be three. Uh, well, three. Kind of, yeah, there'll be a, a third one right uh, before, I think, the album. Arrived. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, Man, yeah, I, three. I'm excited. When I first heard that you had this new album coming out, I I was so close to just shitting my pants, really. Like, <laughs> I that's insane, because I never... I never really got into you guys until after you guys released uh, Ghost, Heart of, Ghost Harvest. So it's just great seeing uh, bands that I love still coming out with new music. Like, I, I love it. Thanks, man. So you, you, you didn't know Virgin's Tale until the Ghost Harvest albums. Wow. Wow. Well, yeah. I remember, I'm, I'm sort of like a, a younger guy compared to like probably most of your fans, I'd say. I'm, I'm, I'm like around, I'm 19 years old, so... No, this is this is interesting. This is because every every record that we do, we bring in new people who never really got into the band because mm -hmm. this is this is proof. This is good. Yeah, this is good. Yeah, uh, I just want I just want to let you know that uh, young fans love you, uh, like as as a representative of them. Us young fans, we we love you. Uh, we're getting we're getting some of our friends into it. Also, we're spreading the word. Uh, we we just we just love the band really. There's right, there's not really much we can say there. Thanks. Well, if you like if you like the uh, spiritual warfare, um, the record is 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 in that barbaric romantic zone. The rest of the mm -hmm. record is very much there. It's I didn't uh, uh, we didn't go off on any kind of like um, blues tangents or anything like that. It is it is what what it is. It's 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 that sort of style throughout the record. Yeah. So so it's more of like a return to like uh, a more heavy metal sort of aggressive sound of it's course, very much so it's very much like that yeah and it's all pretty pretty darn aggressive you know i mean as i said there are the well even the ballads are, are you know they're pretty violent there's a, there's a mm -hmm. violence throughout the whole record it's kind of a um there's a violent beauty to it and um there's a, a seriousness to it um yeah, it's 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 largely dark because the subject matter is dark. Um, so what are you gonna do? You know, make happy mute jingles to, to that? No, it's not gonna work. I mean, there's a no. there's, there's a, there's a, a section in the record where uh, King Pentheus, who's the guy who opposes Dionysus' uh, worship in Thebes, he gets his head ripped off by his mother. So I mean, it's a wow. It's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, brutal record, yeah. From that standpoint, yeah. Yeah, that's. I know Sable's really into uh, Greek, Greek, uh, Latin, and Latin mythology, so he he will probably understand some of those references. I I probably won't. I I was not a very good student when that stuff came up, so. I is is you can always uh, catch up, you know, again. But the, I do provide a synopsis in in the booklet. Yep, you, you do. Oh, yeah. yeah, and I speak about like uh, um, some people have asked me in uh, like this week about the uh, cover. That's not Jesus. That's Dionysus. <laughs> Dionysus was, uh, in addition to some myths, he's ripped to shreds by his uh, enemies and by his most devoted followers. Sometimes, wow, and literally invited okay. the God, you know. But also, some myths he is hung on a tree, and that's uh, you know same same thing. This there's a, a long history of these dying, resurrecting God man people who were crucified in, in in that manner and whatnot. So I do cross pollinate all mm -hmm. of the references, so that's why there is there is that in there, and I explain all this in in the booklet. So if you got yeah. Questions afterwards, after if you've read it and whatnot, uh, feel free to ask me. Of course. Oh, thank you for that. Sure. Um, 
Thank you. I, I had another question, but it's sort of yeah, yeah. Going back to the uh, the thing about the ballads, where like y you can't really put a happy tune over it because the the world is sort of a darker place than some might realize. And uh, Ronnie James Dio actually said it best, where he said, uh, "It's really hard to write a happy song in a minor key." So, <laughs> uh, and that also leads me to another thing. Uh, you said you've met Ronnie James Dio before, and you said it was one of the best experiences ever. Um, yes. So, like, uh, what are some of the specifics that you guys discussed? How, like, he, what do you remember about him? He was an incredibly nice guy. I met him more than once, but the first time I met him, um, I was kind of being introduced to him by a girl I know, mm -hmm. Gail Flug. Um, and she was like kind of introducing me and, 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 and he stopped her and goes, I know, I know who you are, my son. And he knew who I was or, already. And, uh, you know, that kind of, you know, shocked me because, you know, sometimes you're on the road with certain, you know, younger bands, whatever, and they, you know, they won't even give you the time of day. And here's this mm -hmm. link, and he's like saying, I know who you are, my son. I was like, oh. That was like, okay. you know, that was very endearing, you know, and then I met him uh, several gigs after that and you know we we drank wine and we I, we talked about uh you yeah, know we talked about rainbow and uh and dio and uh sabbath and all, all that sort of stuff yeah and music in, in general and uh it was just a really really very very personal very very uh very kind nice guy yeah mm -hmm. when was that that you met him were you like touring at the same time or what were the no, when I first met him, uh, where was it? Um, it was probably it was in New York or uh, I forget what what venue it was, but it was in, it was in New York State. Yeah, I went to went to the, go see the gig, and I met him there. And then I, then I saw him again at the uh, Jones Beach with uh, Sabbath when he was in Sabbath, and I met him another 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 deal gig. Uh, so I met him you know a handful of uh, times. Yeah, very nice guy. Yeah. You meet, you know, you meet, you meet people along the way who are, uh, who are really great, and some who are, uh, you know, don't really, you know, give yeah. you uh, the uh, time of day. But um, it's one thing that I learned early on is try to be, you know, as personable as you could be to, you know, people who, are, who listen to your music and, you know, want to, want to want to have a you know chat with you that kind of thing and you know ronnie definitely personified that he was he was mm -hmm. that, that guy yeah yeah it's just crazy to think about this mythical this almost mythical person that's one of the few people i i don't normally like calling people gods because that sort of puts them on a pedestal really um and but he's one of the few people that i will recognize as sort of like like we truly didn't deserve him on this earth really um he just and just for him to say like i know you my son like that that must have been a earth shattering moment in your life i was like i was i was completely like you know blown away by it I, and then it, it it dawned on me why he would know me you know also because uh years ago when we were doing like i don't know what we were doing it was one of the early early records maybe it was noble or whatever but um he had done a video for um I think it was Holy Diver, and okay. uh, there was a thing. And I was speaking to somebody from Kerrang Magazine, and I said I, you know, I, I would would like to lend Ronnie my sword for the video, that kind of a thing. And they they put that in the in, in like the little news you know thing that they have in the in the front of the magazine. And I think he saw that, <laughs> so <laughs> that's probably when he first heard heard of uh, this guy David DeFace, you know, coming around. <laughs> so was the sword in the video? Was that yours? No, no, it wasn't. I never got a chance to uh, get the sword. No, no, no. Okay. I wanted to. I wanted to give him the uh, uh, yeah a sword. Man, imagine that your sword in a freaking landmark video. That man. That would have been neat. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy to think about a guy who basically, when Sabbath was at his low point, brought Sabbath up into something completely new and took it to the next level. And someone who played with Blackmore and sort of helped sow the seeds of modern power metal really uh yeah 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 stargazer yeah. light in the black you mm -hmm. know it's a battle yeah. on it's just all epic uh, stuff yeah of course Great like stuff. 
it, it's just amazing. Like, I have, I'm collecting like all of the CDs throughout his career, and I have like at least like oh, well over half of them. Like, it, I, I love him so much. Yeah, I've got I pretty much uh, all of that as as well. Uh, some of it's vinyl. Some of it actually was a uh, cassette. You know, <laughs> which still play. <yeah. laughs> I like cassettes. That's yeah. that's funny you say vinyl because I got go. one of my favorite albums of all time. Really. Yeah. Fuck yeah. yeah. Like, it's just, yeah. We, he Excellent. was insane. Excellent. I love him. I like the first one a lot, also. First one's great. Yeah. 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 Uh, so let's, looking through our notes, like, that's basically, I guess we didn't really ask you this question. It's, it's sort of buried in there, but um, what would you say are some of your favorite uh, classical composers? Well, definitely Debussy, which I mentioned earlier, Chopin, uh, very fond of. Um, I like this guy called Gustav Holst. He wrote this thing called Planets, which is pretty amazing. It's kind of like heavy metal classical music, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, especially it's the uh, Mars, that one. Uh, yeah. Interesting stuff. Um, there's a guy um, called Beethoven that uh, you may have heard of, I, I, and he's, uh, he's he's written a few good works along the way. He's one of my, my favorites as well. Um, yeah, the list goes on. There's a strange guy called Scriabin that I like. He's got this uh, wonderful stuff, uh, very mm -hmm. eerie sounding music. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not... I like, uh, I like the planets by Holst a lot. I know Black Sabbath. Black Sabbath was actually influenced by that. Yeah, and uh, Bowie used to use, I think, uh, some Mars as his entrance music. I mean, a lot of people have used that. It. It's got that sort of fanfare kind of thing, you know. Yeah, I've always liked classical music a lot. What well, was this? Is uh, like in that genre? If you listen to the music from the first Cohen the Barbarian album, that's a uh, Polydorus, Basel Polydorus. That's some pretty great music. It's definitely heavy metal classical music. Yeah. I don't know if yeah. you remember the movie, but yeah. It was yeah you, you can definitely tell that classical music has really influenced you throughout the years. Of course, in your uh, your piano playing, uh, when you listen to uh, even stuff way back in the day, uh, when you would mix in uh, keyboard parts, with the uh, or uh, you would have uh, I don't know if they had MIDI back then like MIDI instruments they they didn't I, they had it but we didn't we didn't I didn't know about it. we didn't know about it back then no that 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 I didn't know about MIDI until like I don't know the the, the late nineties or something like that yeah yeah but like where you uh, could play on a keyboard and you can make these all all these different sounds and effects and such uh, where you could put these or basically orchestral parts without actually having an orchestra yeah. which yeah. is amazing really yeah it's li it's very liberating you know mm -hmm. to be able to do that rather than say oh i i, I really need the uh the london symphony to show up on thursday <laughs> not yeah to go down so you know you just end up doing it yourself yeah yeah but it'll be yeah. nice to actually do like emily and some of these you know more uh scored out things with with the actual instruments we really kind of need to do that i would love to do a gig like that someday maybe in the uh Kropos, i said you know of course yeah or the uh, roman coliseum something like that yeah mm -hmm. time, but, yeah so, so like also around the book of burn around the book of burning time uh you also did some shows in uh actually in italy with ed where like you would play acoustic versions of the songs, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. and it would actually show like you said it would show how the songs were originally written a little bit. Uh, do you plan on doing something similar like that in the future, perhaps? I would like to. Yeah, I really, really enjoy that because that's like those are like some of the only gigs where I can actually hear what it is I'm singing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's so bloody loud on stage, you know. So I really enjoy those gigs for that reason and you know i can do that with with, with a guy like edward because you know we have a lot of the same record collection we have a long deep mm -hmm. history of working together so it's very spontaneous you know uh he'll start something i'll dive in i'll start something he'll dive in and uh we know how to uh, play off each other and a lot of 
a lot of the uh, kind of the crazy vocal melisma things that I do now started um, when I was doing that kind of stripped down thing with, with Edward because there was only one guitar, so he couldn't really solo. There was nothing backing him up. Uh, mm -hmm. And he also, at first, when we first started doing it, was like, yeah, I feel really naked here. I was, yeah, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll just, I'll make a lot of noise for you. And uh, so I would uh, constantly do something. And uh, I, he, then he started to relax and get really, then, you know, comfortable with it. So, uh, yeah, yeah. That, we developed our, our, our thing that way. Now, how did you know about those shows from the uh, from the video that I made for the... Uh, uh, God uh, or? Uh, no, actually, I, I'm just a really massive fan and I like to watch your interviews way back in the day. Okay. Uh, like it, it's crazy to see you guys uh, evolve actually through these interviews. And uh, uh, yeah, it's just I, like I could hear you talk all day basically. So uh, it, it, it's, it's pretty great to learn from those interviews, because it's basically like a time machine, really, especially with YouTube nowadays. Um, yeah, right. It's like the biggest form of information. Like, it's pretty great to have that stuff in general, really. If you, I don't know if you watched it, but if you've seen the the uh, the, the kind of movie movie documentary thing I made for the Gothic Voodoo, this explains a lot of that in there. How we arrived at that style, Edward and I, and uh, um, how that album. Uh, was made, and you'll see some of those uh, shows. Well, I think there's uh, some clips from France where Edward and I did some stuff. There's like a, a snippet of Gate of Kings there, and uh, and there's some stuff just from uh, that we did, you know, at, at home where we're uh, doing, I think, uh, Transfiguration, Stripped Down, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just said, you know. Yeah. So the, the, if you look, if you if you're interested in that, that's side of it. It's it's very ex much explained in that uh, in that movie. Yeah, I also listen to like bootlegs of your shows because you guys don't actually have any official live albums out. Is that something that you guys might want to do in the future? I would like to do that. Yeah, yeah. I've got stuff. I've got. I have almost every night recorded from the uh, Atrius tour. It's got something like, you know, I don't know, 40 discs or some shit like that. But, uh, yeah, I would like to do it. That's why we did, also why we kind of did uh, Gothic Voodoo, because that was done, that was done largely just live in uh, my living room. Mm -hmm. and, then, and added, like, some other little bits and pieces to that. But the uh, the basic uh, framework of the vocal and the keyboard was all done done live, you know, so we wanted oh, to okay. kind of that yeah. yeah and so yeah well we will do something of, of that nature yeah yeah again in, in all manner of, of speaking the electric and the yeah. more stripped down yeah yeah we're that's actually putting see, the live show together now as we speak oh awesome that's that's awesome yeah. uh that that, made I, me think of, sorry go ahead no go ahead sorry i was gonna say that made me think of another question do, do you think that you might like have any uh, any demos or unfinished songs or anything like that that you might put out on a future album or a deluxe edition? Because I would definitely be interested in hearing any unfinished songs, any early demos or any material like you were talking about, the uh, stuff that you and Edward were doing after our exercises. There are um, probably hours of, st of, of um, tapes of Edward and I just doing that stripped down thing. I've got a lot of stuff which I could put out on its own in one kind of like unplugged situation mm -hmm. record, or uh, maybe some bonus stuff. We did a little bit of that on- um, Noble in Savage. In Invictus had uh, a, a disc called Fire Spirits, and that was all that sort of stripped down stuff. Yeah, yeah. All done, yeah, if you listen to uh, those medleys, that's all just, uh, that's straight up live. You just write to, not even multi-track, that's just right to, two track mini disc so you couldn't you know fix it or whatever it is what it is that's exactly what it was so i have lots of that more of that that's really good stuff so yeah and there are there are a few few things that we uh tracked along the way uh, that I still have not seen the light of day yeah so there there there'll be things and we're going to be doing um reissues of probably uh, eventually bacchanalia and uh nocturnes and that'll have bonus stuff as well so they'll and we always do that. It's kind of, of our 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 thing.
Yeah, I love the bonus track, uh, Do You Walk With God, that, like, Ooh. it's just that emotional sort of, it's just you and the keyboard, uh, just emotional sort of, um, I don't know what exactly it's about, per se, but I, I just love the emotion that you give it, and I think it would actually work well for, like, some other songs, actually, like uh, the, the Burning of Rome, for example, or even stuff earlier than that. I think it would work well with uh, piano arranges. I think you're right. Yes, because they were, you know, they're, they're, they're written that way. They're written to be played with one instrument and, a, and, the, and the voice. Mm -hmm. or, no, or, or no voice, some of it. You know, when I was doing Visions of Eden, I listened back to the uh, piano stuff. It was like, I could just like let it go like that. But of course I had lyrics and whatnot, you know, it's, uh, and then I was working with an engineer and he was like, you mean there's more? Yeah, yeah, there's more, there's gonna be more. <laughs> uh, I'm David DeFay, there's always more. <laughs> yeah, there's always more. So uh, it's, it's meant that way. It's like what what we do is, is really like, it's all baked into the cake or the honey uh, Vesuvius, uh, if you will. It's already baked in there. It's not like, the other stuff that's added is not for cosmetic reasons. It doesn't need to. It doesn't need to be there, you know. Um, and we, when I made that Gothic Voodoo record, we tried to explain that and that movie and show that. Uh, not everyone understood that, but that's mm -hmm. all right, you know. Whatever. There, yeah. there will always be people who don't really understand. That's completely fine, really. There, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. No, whatever. You don't get it. You don't get it. Maybe you'll get it. You know. 40 years from now, your children will get it, you know, possibly, kind of a thing. Who knows? Yeah. And the the song uh, Hearts on Hearts on Fire from oh, yeah. Goes Harvest 1, I, I think that would be a great song to sing live because it has, like, the, the sort of chorus that, that that's melodic. You can sing along to it, and it has that amazing solo, which is actually by, I think it's by Josh, right? It, like, I think I saw something in the liner notes that might have... No. That might be wrong, though. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yes, that is Josh. That's uh, that is Josh. I think conjuring his inner Edward. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. Nor normally yeah. he just plays the seven string uh, guitar rhythm parts. In he played solos also on 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 Pacanalia. Not Pacanalia. Not, not everything, but he played he played he played most of the uh, homework on that record. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like, you know, that was just one of those, you know, it's uh, it's very free and easy to be in Verdant Steel. If you're not able to be there, you know, we will cover it and carry on and no one is angry at anybody. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because sometimes people's lives don't always coincide with studio dates or even going on the road, you know, whatever. So be it. So uh, we just we work it out and we, we are all friends and, uh, you know, we'll, all right, we'll see you on the next one, you know, you know so to speak. And it works out that way. I mean, it's, it's, maybe it's unusual for uh, for um, to for people to to get that, but that's just how we work. Because you know, we're just friendly that way, and it's and it's it's no. Um, I don't want it to be a prison and a burden to be in the band. I want people to be you know be free and and to and when when they can devote to it, then they give it their thousand percent. And when they're not able to be there, all right, you know, I'll see you on the next one. Of course, because you don't want that stress weighing down on them. Like, uh, there there have always been bands where like they're always forced to uh, to carry on, even even if they don't really want to. Just think of like late Zeppelin. Everyone was tired. Uh, I mean, some people like it, of course, but there's there's an obvious shift in their sound where it sounded like they were sort of getting tired. Like you think of like Coda or uh, what was that last album? In Through the Outdoor, which actually has amazing tracks with that I love. But even then, you can you, you read what was going on at the time in the band. and Yeah, there was it, drugs going on and stuff. Drugs. Yeah, a, a lot of very bad stuff for for the mind, really. Not easy to make music under those um, conditions, if you will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And it's not easy to go out on the road if you really don't like being with the guy that, you, that you're going to be on stage with. I mean, you can do it, but it's not pleasant at all. Yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah, like the, the Eagles with that whole debacle between the two guitarists. Uh, I, I don't know if you know about that. I know a little bit about it. I'm not that well versed in eagle lore, uh -huh. you know. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's probably like you can 
any band you want, we want to name, you can you know have an, some issues like like that along the way. I mean, we've mm -hmm. had issues with with, with with guys along the way, but at the end of the day, it's all worked out pretty well. Um, mm -hmm. But you, you, I like it to be. I like it to be family oriented. We're like you do the gig, then after the gig, everybody has dinner. You discuss the gig, what was good, what sucked, what could be better, that sort of thing. And it feels more like, then it feels more like a unit, you know, because the records are one thing. The records in the studio, yeah, I'm the I'm always been the main guy who's been there, I'm cracking the whip on myself and and everything else. But live, it's 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 very different. You know, it's very different. Mm -hmm. Everybody um, kind of blossoms more, and they have their own solo spots and all that sort of thing, and get get to really you know extend whatever it is and say whatever it is they want to say. And I, you know, I, I love that about about the live experience. And so I'm looking forward to getting back out there and doing something again with with that. And we and so we are. Of course, if you have any U.S. dates, I you and it's near my area. I would love to come. Uh, where, where are you folks? Where are you um, guys? Uh, I'm from the Indianapolis area. I don't know if you really are going to go there anytime soon, but if you do, you you'll guaranteed see me there. We will let you know. And and Shable? I'm from Florida. OK, I've been there a few times. Yeah, mm -hmm. you do any Florida date and I'll definitely be there. Uh, we, the last thing we did in that that neighborhood was uh, 40,000, 70,000 tons of metal we did one of those things that's out of miami on the boat you know for three days yeah that was the last oh, thing. yeah 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 that was interesting it's like uh the movie never ends you know there's always a band on stage and there's always uh music blasting somewhere it's like non-stop metal yeah awesome yeah, yeah. it yeah. sounds like my kind of thing really you probably love it yeah yeah and if there's free food there just hey you can count me in Oh yeah, there is. It's all included. Yeah, the drinks, awesome. everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I I've been on a cruise and and I just I just love that whole aesthetic. Like uh, just eat whenever you want. You know, sleep whenever you want. It, it it's it's really amazing. Just go anywhere on the ship. It yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was it was uh, it was quite the experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Leave it at that. Yeah. All right. Um. Right. That is literally everything. All right. All right. <laughs> so, so it was great having you. Check out the new album, uh, new single, uh, new music videos coming out. Check those out too. David of Faith, it was absolutely amazing having you as a huge fan. Thank you. Guys. Thank you both. Thank you yeah. both. You got a fan for life right here. I. I My pleasure. I, me, yeah. me piace is with Hansi. Me, yeah. me piace. Uh, Arriba Dirty. As I say, yeah, by the goddesses. All right, <laughs> by the gods, this was a great one. Uh, I'll probably have this video out sometime next week. Um, I need, all right, I need to do some editing, put some visuals up that you're talking about, of course. Okay, if you need any uh stills or anything like that, feel free to uh email us and uh send them on over. Yeah, whatever, yeah, and some concert footage would also be pretty useful too if you have some of that also. Yeah, yeah. Whatever you whatever you need, we can get going. Yeah. Of course, I'll I'll let Mark know. Um. So, thank you, uh, Sable. Anything you want to say? I was just gonna say thank you so much for your time today, and I'm really looking forward to hearing this new album. Thank you. Thank you for your questions, both of you. Thank you for your belief and uh, kindness and support. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Yeah. And I will email you once the video is up so you can, you can okay. post it on your uh, website. Yeah, absolutely. So cool. thank you. All have right. A, have a good one, David DeFay. You too. You too, guys. Thank Take it easy. Guys. All right. Uh, Cheers. See, see you. you. <laughs> Blood from a black blade You are the product of my hate I am the one who lies in wait I am the law of your estate I am the god who disagrees I am your king I rip the pain from shattered lives 